So the next stage um, will be our panel discussion. And uh, this, I'm very pleased to introduce the chair of uh, our panel, uh, Dr. Steve Schachter, who is a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, who's the, also the director of the Center for Integration of Medicine and Innovative Technology, known as CIMIT, and also director of education at the OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine. Uh, Dr. Schechter has been an unwavering and very generous supporter of integrative medicine with his time and advice, and we, I don't know what we would do without him. We are immensely grateful for all of the help he has given us over the past years. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to see many old friends, many new folks I'd like to get to know. Welcome David Eisenberg back, who was the person that got me involved with the OSHA Center years and years ago. And it's a pleasure to see how it's evolved and transformed. This, is, uh, this panel discussion is really meant to be a time for those of you who've um, joined with us this afternoon to participate and become engaged in the conversation. Uh, and in that spirit, I would like to uh, call on Michelle Middleman, uh, who has been a big supporter of this conference. Uh, Michelle, where are you? Hi. Please come on up. And Michelle has been a leader in global strategies to incorporate integrative medicine into healthcare. And I would uh, welcome any remarks or observations you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Actually. You know, it is such a pleasure to be here. I see so many wonderful, familiar faces. You know, it's a long time living here in Boston, and um, it's been a long time in coming to have some this particular event. So this is wonderful. Um, um, again, my name is Michelle Middleman. I'm a co-founder and the CEO of uh, Global Advances in Health and Medicine, which was a journal that was launched in 2011, um, which um, it's pretty much a communication platform to catalyze social media, or actually, I think we should probably, um, related to David King's presentation, really call it a cognitive network, um, to build collaborations, innovations around whole person and whole system approaches to health and well-being. So it a, has a pretty much distinct um, um, mission and vision, and so, um, we're here today um, really um, enjoying the, um, the approach in terms of really bringing everyone together in, in very many different ways. Um, I also, you know, was really um, taken by David King's presentation in terms of this is um, Global Advances is another microcosm. You know, it's another place where um, we are... Um, part of it in terms of different systems spreading out in different ways. Um, and so, um, you know, it's instead of, you know, we're trying to eliminate the serendipity and really create the collaborations and the networks that can really build innovation and build different things in different ways. So um, just to um, please think of us when your, your submissions, and also you have little cards attached to your um, itineraries to um, get a six month uh, subscription. But I really also wanted to say something else that, you know, I've lived in this community for 30 years, and um, I can't tell you how much this event means. It's a pivotal historical event um, really to bring people together in a new way, in a different way where um, that historically we all know that um, institutions work uh, sometimes separately in silos as we saw and to be able to bridge and to really share commonalities in terms of research um, it's really, really quite remarkable. Um, you know, we're all interconnected and interdependent. Um, and you know, I, I just wonder, I cannot help but wonder with such enthusiasm as we think about where can this go? 
You know, we've talked about so many of the different collaborations that are existing now, cross disciplines, cross institutions, um, innovations that are being shared in different ways. And I just, I, um, you know, I invite everyone here to kind of think about what will this all look like in another 10 years after what we've seen just in the past 10 years. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, you made my job a little bit easier because you just framed the uh, theme of this discussion, which is where can we go, where should we go? Uh, first, I'd like to welcome David, Dr. David Rosenthal to the panel, former director of the Zakem Center at Dana-Farber. Uh, <clears throat> Helen, in her opening remarks, challenged us to uh, get to know each other and to think of ways that we could leverage our uh, resources and our interests the whole concept being that the whole is going to obviously be more than the sum of the parts, but the question is how do we build on the collaborative spirit that uh, has already occurred, that we've heard about today, um, introduce more nodes to the network, develop more hubs um, to carry through the network science theme. Uh, and since all of you are such a very important part of this community, we wanted to uh, encourage you to offer your opinion or perspective along with our panel members on just where do we go from here? What are the opportunities? Uh, how should we organize follow-up from this meeting, from this forum? Uh, where are the uh, opportunities for uh, cross-fertilization of ideas and making further progress in this field? Uh, if you care to come up uh, to the microphones and uh, we'll call on you for your comments, uh, or do we have handheld mics as well? And I think we probably best if you can approach the microphone so we can all hear you. Um, and I'd also like to ask our, our panelists as well, given your experience uh, so far, and um, what do you see as opportunities for further bringing together the uh, integrative uh, medical uh, centers from across Boston and Cambridge? Uh, in terms of research or clinical care. David, since uh, you're new to the panel, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And first of all, I, I think a great congratulations should go to Dr. Langevin for really organizing this. When we talked, when Helene first took the job over, we discussed ways of how do we communicate and collaborate together. Uh, on various things. I was the medical director of the Zakem Center and Helene was coming in as the director of Osher Center and uh, wouldn't it be great if we could all collaborate and work together uh, throughout the Harvard University community and further uh, on various projects and it was great uh, to see what's happened uh, in a year's time, Helene, that what you've been able to produce here with your staff uh, and all the collaborations and I think this is a beginning uh, as Michelle Middleman has said, I think that uh, there's been lots of attempts in the past to try to get groups together to collaborate, but I think that this is the initiative we all needed. And the question is, uh, as Dashan said, how do we go ahead with the next steps? And I, I believe the next steps is communication is, is really paramount. And the question is, how can we communicate, uh, for example, summary of this meeting, a summary of the abstracts, uh, we hear, now hear there's a new journal on integrative medicine by, uh, uh, and our editor is one of the panel members, right, uh, Rob Saper, uh, and is, is that one way of communicating? Is there another way we can get out a uh, monthly newsletter uh, with what's going on in the various centers? Uh, so I think that there's a lot we can do. Uh, one other thing that I uh, pr can promote, I hope I can promote, uh, that when Helene and I talked uh, uh, last year, we talked about another meeting. Uh, at that time, I was, head, I was on the board of the Society for Integrative Oncology, and I said, how about having a meeting here in Boston? So we are going to have a meeting here in Boston in November of 2015, combining the Society of Integrative Oncology, the Society of Acupuncture Research, and the Fascist Society. So this will be a very unique meeting, and again, the collaboration of three different groups all working uh, to solve some problems. Thank you very much. Please. Sit down. 
And, um, and obviously grant funding as well. So I'm curious as we move forward, um, which of your centers or programs are revenue generating or how are you otherwise subsidized? Thanks. Now we only have 20 minutes, so. <laughs> uh, Rob, you wanna to to take that first? I think that's a $64,000 question. I can certainly say our program isn't positive and I'd be very surprised if any other one isn't. But that's exactly the metric that we have to look at. And so if integrative medicine truly brings value to patients, that has to be demonstrated and that business model has to be shown to healthcare executives, hospital leaders, et cetera. And so, um, so it can be mainstreamed and, 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 and we can be in the positive. Until that happens, it's nice what we do, but it's not necessary. Uh, I think if, if you heard Rob's talk, the issues of disparities and how you handle some people who have means and some people who don't, um, give an example. Um, we've been interested in different delivery models for cognitive behavioral therapy for kids with chronic pain. And group-based models have been looked at for a long time by John Kabat-Zinn and others for adults. And so Rachel Coakley is a psychologist in our group who developed a model with children and adults, 15 children, 15 uh, sets of parents coming t together. And because some people can't pay for it, if you call it a psychoeducational intervention, where those who can pay, pay something, those who can't, don't, unlike healthcare where you, Massachusetts, you can't do sliding scale officially for healthcare. It turned out to be an efficient way to provide that service in a way that breaks even by the, and offers it to more people for a high intensity short set of settings. And she's got quite a bit of outcomes uh, data on that intervention. But that's an example of where a group-based model and even though you think health insurance ought to pay for it, but while they won't, it's a way of at least delivering it to a broader group of people. So that's just one example. If I can Go ahead, Peter. just broaden the discussion on, on the value of these programs, I think Dr. Mehta and uh, Zev Schulman have talked about caring for the care providers. And some of our work is targeting populations that have a lot of challenges like back pain in nurses. And the cost for replacing a high-level nurse are really high to the hospital and nurse turnover and employee turnover. And the cost of errors due to um, not being in, in your highest function are really high. So I think this question about what's the uh, effectiveness and the cost effect of these programs can be broadened beyond just uh, patient um, revenue to the larger revenue of the healthcare systems. Greg, did you want to add? Yeah, I would just second what we heard about developing hybrid models. Um, so as you saw, several of us have an internal medicine, integrated medicine consultation, which you can bill insurance for, but for the, the group session or massage, et cetera, yoga, there's a um, you know, fee for service um, for the, the patient coming through. Uh, just as an anecdote, um, we were visited by uh, CMS, um, um, well, I guess about four years ago, and wellness or art sort of programs are on the radar screen because they're going broke, and uh, um, so we have to keep that in front of us. Uh, and uh, but these hybrid models, I think, thanks, you know, Dr. Mehta Darshan has done a great job as our medical director. And we're, we're uh, uh, at a break-even point now, which is really good. Uh, Rob, I think, did you mention that you have a PCORI grant, uh, Boston Medical Center, to study cost effectiveness? Uh, we try to incorporate cost effectiveness uh, metrics in all our studies and the PCORI grant and our yoga grant so that we can get good economic data to then make justifications to um, corporate uh, funders, uh, CEOs, insurance companies of the uh, cost effectiveness of a given intervention. So, so given that your centers represent a spectrum from community-based um, medicine to academic health centers, um, 
pediatric hospitals and so forth, are there funders out there, are there um, you know, funding organizations interested in cost effectiveness of integrated medicine that may be you know, compelled to award a grant to a composite you know, to, to, across the spectrum of various healthcare models, the medical home and so forth? Um, that would be a very tangible way of collaborating one group with the next. Uh, are you aware, is anyone aware of any such funding sources out there? Um, ARC, you know, AHRQ is very interested in that. Um, NIH less so, uh, PCORI even less so. Um, usually it won't work well as your primary aim, but mm -hmm. often as a secondary tertiary aims. I think certainly a Boston-wide collaborative looking at some of those questions would be incredibly innovative and attractive. And I guess one of the reasons why I'm here at the podium is to say that it can work across institutions. Uh, the organization I work with called CIMIT is a consortium of Harvard, Boston University, MIT, the VA system, Northeastern, uh, Draper Laboratory, MIT, if I didn't mention them already. And uh, it's truly remarkable when you start to tap into faculty from across you know, the entire um, ecosystem, what possible opportunities there are for aha moments, which we heard about earlier. Another question, uh, David? Hi, so I've got a question about collaboration in general. My wife recently finished her PhD at Harvard and she's got a tenure track position and I'm learning about academia um, and about the kind of incentive structures that are in place for her to get tenure. And uh, they don't seem to me to completely foster um, cross-disciplinary collaboration. And so, you know, one, one of the questions I have, you know, um, I, I think often there are technological changes that precede the cultural changes that need to happen to make the most of those technologies. And so, you know, I'm curious if you guys have thoughts about policy and cultural changes that you think need to happen to lower the barriers to the sort of work you want to do. Any takers on that? Chuck, go ahead. I, I'm not sure that collaborating across disciplines uh, is, a, is a downside in terms of proceeding towards academic advancement and all that. I think in all kinds of areas, picking the right collaborations makes sense and fosters your search. And that's true where, you know, it's true in neuroscience where people who do fancy optics mm -hmm. collaborate with people who do uh, electrophysiology. It's, it's, I think it's just picking the right collaborations all over. So I don't know that it's harder in one area than another. I think it, it's key to what we all do. I, let me just throw in a very specific example too. Could, maybe you guys can play Peter, off. Peter, you may want to mention oh, the sorry. OSHA well, opportunities. Well, I, I think there's a, a meta level to this which is really relevant to this panel, which is if we're all going to collaborate together and dissolve some of our silos, what are we going to say is our success versus the success of the network? Um, and I do think that, that there probably are metrics that people like you and Dr. Barabasi can show that in working together, each of the nodes is more productive and creative. But I think it's a different way of looking at it than the more reductionist siloed way. But I think the analogy to your wife's career is, is very relevant to this sort of meta level of how will we all work together and um, share our resources so that we all benefit and we benefit the whole at the same time. And I think that's a really challenging but important question. That, that, that was exactly kind of the example I was going to give is I know that publication is a, is a very good metric, right? But um, if somebody creates a data set that they don't publish on but a host of other publications are built on, it seems that we don't have as good a way of um, tracking that in the same same sort of way. So I, I don't know if you have ideas about what you'd like to see or if you were to make recommendations for people setting policy to say, here's the direction we'd like to push in. I mean, you, you talked about one of them, but. Yeah. I mean, I think the increasing use of the co-first authorship, you know, that if you write a paper in cell or nature or science and there's two first, you know, the 
both authors contributed equally to this still protects people who are in large-scale collaborations a bit. I, I think it's, it's helping that. And I think we're seeing, you know, trends now in NIH funding, albeit that the total level is down, of efforts to foster um, interdisciplinary, in fact, even multi-institutional research. There's something called the National Centers for Accelerated Innovation at NIH um, and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has funded three centers across the country, including one here in Boston, to um, create new diagnostics therapies uh, for heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders based on multi-disciplinary um, collaborations. Uh, and furthermore, to blend in uh, a business uh, commercialization mentality to that as well. And even NCAM now is, is uh, supporting some of that same kind of work through their SBIR grants. So, uh, please, let's have your question. Uh, Eric Ruzine, Boston Medical Center. Um, fantastic talk. The networks are, are, are beautiful. Um, and I'm wondering how electronic medical records could be used and how something like a practice-based research network could be applied to these centers to answer the questions we're all interested in. Good question. Um, does anyone have experience with multi-institutional use of EMRs for research purposes? I, th Rob? I think a number or, of us do. Um, the frustration is that the commercial systems don't talk to each other well, that Brigham, Beth Israel, and Children's and Dana-Farber are on different systems even though they're adjacent and patients go back and forth between them. and. They were designed for billing and administrative purposes more than for clinical outcomes. There are a lot of, I think, very creative people who work on getting around that. I think Ken Mandel and Isaac Kohane and others have taken thoughtful efforts at how to use these clunky and poorly designed systems better, but it's, it's a constant challenge. I, uh, I think many of us design our own parallel, well, We've designed them so every clinical encounter has a set of outcome measures that we build in at the time of care so that they are data element driven rather than text driven. It takes a lot of work. It's clunky. It chews up clinicians' time being scribes, but at least if we're all going to be scribes, we get data back from it. But I think it's everyone's first. Everyone doing clinical outcomes is frustrated by that, uh, by how poorly designed they were. Anybody disagree with that? Um, I, I would definitely agree. I, I, I think, though, that points out to a very unique opportunity that we have as uh, is that in getting together that we can agree upon, similar to what uh, Rob, has, uh, will, or I imagine, will describe in a moment on, on, on what's happening at BraveNet, but even thinking on a local scale here amongst all of the Boston institutions at patients who are, who take part in or who are recommended to integrative medicine services, we can agree upon a common set of outcomes that we could create a, a multi-institutional data repository uh, in a way that is supported by perhaps uh, an innovation, whether it's through maybe something like CIMIT or through philanthropy, where we can, um, we can, we can have that type of robust uh, data collection but, system. But there's national consensus efforts on what outcomes should be obtained in a whole range of spheres, and I think it behooves most of us to try to have every clinical encounter, painful as it is, to, to gather meaningful consensus outcome data as part of our regular daily practice. It takes up time, it takes hiring extra people, it slows down a clinic, but it's something we, it, large thoughtful groups have thought about what different, in different spheres, different patient groups ought to be consensus measures, and I think we ought to all be doing that. Great, terrific. That, we'll have that accomplished before the next uh, forum. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great thing to do, sir. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael McGee. Um, I'm on the clinical staff at McLean. Uh, I'll be the director, corporate medical director for um, behavioral health at Tufts starting next week. So um, I know Greg. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to offer a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, some of the limited research I've done most recently has been in exploring uh, us as uh, biopsychosocial spiritual human beings. And I would challenge us to think about the sort of the spiritual dimension as well 
as we think about integrative medicine. Um, looking at issues of to what degree are we living lives of love and coherence and integrity and meaning, and how does that impact our health and well-being? And how does that affect you know, a medical cost offset? <laughs> um, some of, the, you know, what, some of the stuff I've done is looking at doing sort of uh, multidimensional spiritual assessments and then targeting psycho-spiritual interventions to address relative spiritual weaknesses. And I think meditation, yoga, great tools. Um, uh, I've been practicing meditation now for uh, at least 30 years. Wonderful. But it's going out in the world and then, and then practicing that in our daily lives. It's so important. Um, so that's just one thought about expanding our paradigm to include looking at ways to address and enhance people's spirituality. As an addiction psychiatrist, I think the 12-step uh, uh, paradigm has been uh, one of, of many potential ways to look at that. Um, the second thought is really looking at expanding integrative medicine to also include sort of uh, human services in general. Um, some work that I did about 20 years ago, I was able to show a reduction in cost and improved outcomes by um, providing uh, supportive residential centers to people uh, who were in detox and, and um, we were able to reduce costs and improve clinical outcomes by addressing their social human service needs as well. So that's just to me, I mean, it's all part of the big puzzle, not just integrative medicine, but also the social services as well. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi there. First of all, I want to say thank you. Uh, my name is Linda Cleary. I work as a physician assistant at Visions Healthcare. Um, it's a smaller health facility, and I feel very fortunate to be there. Um, and I'm very happy to be here, but one of the things I just wanted to comment on is I do think that the functional approach of looking at a patient um, has been not talked about a lot today. And it, I personally have seen amazing success after practicing over 20 years in conventional medicine. I think that to actually put this as a piece for a future, whether it's in the educational model, um, which is what I would hope to see. Um, it would be something I would love to have, or has anyone talked about that in the research? Because simply looking at you know, things, I mean, the biochemistry behind it may be a little challenging, but the treatment for some of these patients is simple. You know, supplementing them with vitamins and, and uh, you know, folate deficiencies and things like that, that, you know, again, the biochemistry, I will admit to, can be a little challenging, but I've seen amazing success. And, and if you were looking at the total healthcare dollar, I personally have seen this in taking care of some of these patients who've come into our practice, and I just didn't know if anybody else has talked about this, or if I, I think I saw somebody mention uh, COMT and methylation, which I thought was great, but. So functional outcomes, uh, do those enter into any of the research that we heard about today so far? So I think, so you reference a functional medicine, which is a, um, an emerging, uh, I think, body, or an emerging field in, in integrative medicine or has been associated in, within integrative medicine. I think, again, it goes back to when we think about education, research, and clinic, from my perspective is I think this, again, is, is an opportunity to, to allow for critical thinking to emerge. And, and, and that's really the skill, at least in medical school, that really we're encouraging our, our students to really develop is, is around critical thinking applied you know, functional medicine, a, a part of it that is obviously around applied biochemistry uh, and, and thinking about the relationship of food and, and how food can influence uh, health outcomes and, and other aspects. Again, I would just uh, kind of relay sort of maybe back pedal just a little bit just to really think about what have we already known based on, I mean, all these individuals here have done amazing research and how do you apply that in a system uh, in a way that is uh, replicable, that is doable, and that is uh, is cost effective, and and educating the learners to do that is really the to me the bigger task. And if functional medicine offers that as an experimental paradigm, mm -hmm. I think that's something we can learn from. Okay, thank you. We have time for two more questions. First here. Hi, I really don't have a question. Um, I just wanted to let you know that my name is Bridget Chin. I'm an acupuncturist, uh, medical acupuncturist at uh, Spalding. Rehab Hospital in Charlestown and also at the three outpatient clinics. 
Um, I just wanted to let you know that even though we are not a hub there of research for integrative medicine, we actually incorporate a lot of integrated medicine into our programs. We have a very active integrative medicine lecture series once a month. Uh, for the residents and for all of our um, staff and employees. We have a re-energize program where pre we provide free acupuncture, massage, and Reiki for our employees once a month. Uh, we are involved actively in supporting our uh, marathon runners that are coming up for, for next year and are pr putting together um, a program of Reiki, massage, and acupuncture for sports performance and supporting them through that. We have uh, residents who rotate through my clinic and um, are educated in acupuncture, biofeedback, um, everything uh, for chronic pain patients in our Medford office. Uh, we have uh, Harvard Medical students, Mass uh, General Pain Fellows, only the ones that rotate through our, and uh, our PM&R Fellows. We actively have um, inpatients, um, uh, they, uh, um, they get an integrative medicine consult uh, where they have the opportunity to get free Reiki, uh, which is very, very well run by uh, Judith Frazier, who's behind me, and um, what acupuncture or massage, uh, inpatient, outpatient. Um, and uh, what else do we have? Oh, we have a, we have a uh, eight course week mindful stress reduction for our employees. Um, we have yoga discounted for our employees. We have a, a very active integrative medicine task force run by Eric Leskowitz, and this has been around for over 20 years. Um, Dr. Meta has been there, <laughs> and. Um, We've had uh, Dr. Henry Benson speak for our grand rounds. I gave grand rounds on acupuncture, and uh, our patient population is very unique in that we have spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, um, stroke patients. We have a pediatric patient population, disorders of consciousness uh, group of patients that are in need of integrative medicine, and it's very difficult for me to get any financial benefit or benefit from the people above me uh, to support this, uh, to get more research and to have, you know, more patients, uh, more uh, fellows and medical students and residents involved. So I, I welcome any collaboration and assistance in trying to get uh, the word out. Yeah, here again, it's a very unique population that may, you know, be synergistic with another center and, you know, together form a very, you know, um, viable opportunity for research. And I know a number of veterans, uh, injured veterans, are treated at Spalding as well. And the Defense Department has had an interest in integrative medicine for some time. So, yeah, Peter? Just to um, highlight some of the research that is going on. So we do a number of our Tai Chi studies with the Motion Laboratory based at Spalding Rehab. And some of the work of the fellows of, uh, that Gloria has overseen have done some mindfulness for TBI patients. So I think um, if you poke around a little bit, you'll find some open-minded researchers there that you can collaborate within. But again, this, this, this forum is to make us aware of even our local networks that sometimes we're not aware of. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I think I cut you off before you wanted to say something. No, um, I just wanted uh, us not to um, forget what Michael had brought up about spirituality. And um, it is a very, very important point. Uh, and um, it's interesting when we do our composite resiliency enhancement, that spiritual connectedness always seems to be a dimension that, that improves in patients. Uh, and it's, it's you know, it, it's not lost on us that um, Dr. Barabasi used the term preferential attachment. Um, that's part of uh, nature itself, and that's part of uh, our patients. You know, and so it's, it's reflected in whole person care, which is a gigantic movement that integrative medicine overlaps. Um, and um, so it, it, I'm glad you brought it up, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And please. Well, my, I get to go last. Um, my name is Carol Rossi, and I have been a nurse for 33 years, and I am a recent graduate as a nurse practitioner. So um, my sort of couple of commentary come from uh, a pretty vast background, so just to 
give you that so you'll understand is I worked in patient care, I've done home care, I worked in managed care in, um, as management, I've done research, and now I've also traveled and worked with multiple um, different ethnicities, and, and obviously now I'm uh, a nurse practitioner looking to work in primary care. So my first sort of commentary is, um, and I think we're all thinking this, and the words that came to my head is that um, this is exponentially phenomenal, and I just celebrate all of you because I've been waiting for three decades for something like this to sort of occur. Um, and it also touches upon a, a couple of things that uh, Dr. Mehta had said. Um, the research arena that I worked in was Alzheimer's disease, and about two or three years ago, maybe four, it started to lull a little bit in the research, and um, they were finding very similarly that there was a lot of research, and it wasn't really in a repository, and so that people were like reduplicating or not taking benefit from stuff that had already sort of happened. So that's sort of one commentary on a type of recipro um, excuse me, um, sort of to have a um, repository of that sort of information, which I think you guys shouldn't think of yourselves as just a forum. You're actually the building block of a consortium. And I think, you know, come through to next November, that will become more solidified. Um, and then the sort of second area that I see, which is as a clinician for many years, um, wanting to provide my patients with more. I, I did a holistic nursing thing three, 30 years ago, and I've been a Reiki practitioner for 20 years, which is just part of my bag, if you will. Uh, I never get paid for it, but it's just part of who I am. And um, is a different kind of res uh, repository which creates the information to know what exists. So it's great that I'm interested and I knew about this um, and found out just by Googling and searching, but there are a lot of, um, what I would say, hubs or networks that you're not going to touch because it's so rich in the city or in the surrounding communities with um, you know, the institutions and what's going on and the funding that you receive. But if you have like primary clinicians out in the community, they're not gonna know where to go unless um, the silos of networks and the changing scope of how care is provided and managed care sort of all comes on board. Because basically the common denominator is to provide the best patient care with the best outcomes we can. So I guess my second commentary, if somebody has any response, would be to also build, and some of you have really been doing this, but it's to sort of make it more of an archetype of what people access to find that. Thank you. I, I think because of time we're going to have to end here, but I, I think your comments are, are excellent. And I know the center has plans to create you know, a network of clinicians as well, um, you know, much like what we're seeing here in terms of research, and that is the goal, is to integrate in that dimension as well. So thank you very much. Well, it's been a pleasure. I want to thank our panel. I want to thank our audience. And, you know, the thought occurred to me that perhaps it's no coincidence that Boston is called the hub. <laughs>